We know that the universe is bathed in cosmic rays. Some of these are high energy and some are low energy. We also know that the space between stars is filled with pockets of dense and diffuse gas, partly ionized. Inside these clouds there is a mixture of molecules present, some simple and some complex. Some are thought to be the precursors to life itself. So how do these molecules end up there if the clouds are inert? In order to explain this, scientists need to invoke cosmic rays, which they believe ionize some of the hydrogen and then start a cascade of reactions to produce the more complex molecules. But is there a simpler explanation that they seem to be ignoring? When we examine these clouds, we know that there are dense and diffuse clouds. The dense clouds absorb light and look dark. The diffuse clouds are almost invisible. The only way we can tell that they exist is by the fact that starlight is slightly reddened by passing through this, similar to the reason that the sky looks red at sunset. Back in 2004, scientists published a paper which revived a concept which is over 30 years old. They think that low energy cosmic rays are a more significant source of heating and ionization in this diffuse interstellar clouds than is generally accepted. These low energy cosmic rays would only therefore affect the outer layers of this cloud, causing higher ionization to occur here. This higher ionization also implies that these areas should contain a great abundance of complex molecules. Despite these clouds being cold and not containing much material, there are chemical reactions that occur here. In particular, they have observed an abundance of H3 plus ions. This is a highly reactive form of hydrogen. It is composed of three hydrogen atoms linked together with two outer electrons. They readily give up their proton to another atom or molecule, leaving behind a hydrogen molecule. And this is the main component of molecular clouds. The molecule that receives the proton will then initiate its own chemical reaction. And this breeds a cascade of reactions producing many types of organic molecules from water all the way up to the complex hydrocarbons. H3 plus was first detected in dense molecular clouds in 1996, but was thought to be so small it would be undetectable in diffuse clouds. To their amazement, in 1997 they detected it in a diffuse cloud. And not only this, but they detected it at a rate that was a hundred times greater than they had predicted. Initially, it made no sense to them. It implied that they were either wrong about how rapidly H3 plus was being produced, or how quickly it was being destroyed. Either the high-speed electrons in the cloud don't destroy the H3 plus as easily as people thought, or more H3 plus is produced from cosmic rays than astronomers had suspected. It is thought that cosmic rays can generate H3 plus when they strike a hydrogen molecule, ionizing them and catalyzing the reaction with other hydrogen molecules. Another problem was that they didn't know the rate at which the electrons would recombine with H3 plus. Up to this point, they had only ever measured this rate based on temperatures much higher than that found in the interstellar space. So they decided to run some tests on much cooler temperatures and discovered that this caused the recombination to occur much less frequently. It appeared to be about 40% less efficient at doing this at this cooler temperature. Unfortunately, this would not account for the abundance of H3 plus ions in the diffuse clouds. The only option they felt was left open to them was to consider very low energy cosmic rays might be causing the ionization in the outer edges of the cloud only. This had been proposed before, but experiments had always ruled them out. Now, consequently, their proposal was not widely accepted, but it is worth taking a moment to reconsider their data and maybe looking at this in a slightly different way. Assuming that these are partially ionized clouds, it should be no leap for me to suggest that there are two very important phenomena that must take place. These are filamentation and chemical separation through Marklin convection. Charges will naturally start to flow along magnetic field lines, forming Birkeland currents. In Peratt's book of Physics of the Plasma Universe, he states that diffuse interstellar gas clouds tend to be highly filamented. 
The role of large-scale currents may be very important in defining interstellar structures. Now, Parat goes on to state that the abundance of filaments found is often overlooked and ends up being labelled often as spherical bubbles within the cloud, rather than being due to the line of sight where we would actually be looking at the filament twisting in front of us, making it appear as if it's a spherical bubble, when in fact there is movement of this material across the line of sight, and there is a much larger structure that sits behind it. Now within these filaments, the charges will start to feel an inward force towards the centre of the filament. This will cause a temperature gradient to exist with the greatest temperature on the outside and the coolest towards the centre. This means that they will slowly start to drift inwards and the temperature and the rate of collisions will start to drop. And once the temperature has dropped below the particular molecule's ionization temperature, recombination occurs. And this causes molecules to become sorted according to their ionization potential. Helium, then hydrogen, then oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, silicon, iron, etc. This is called Markland convection and allows the material to be separated radially. Now, it is important to realize that in most of the papers, Markland convection is discussed alongside temperature. The temperature is a very subjective term when discussing plasmas and it is much better to actually discuss the ionization energy itself. Therefore, molecules with a higher ionization energy will collect on the outer edges, and this obviously then still includes helium and hydrogen, and the molecules with lower ionization energy will tend to move further inwards. And as they move inwards, they will reach an energy level where the electrons can recombine with the ion to form the neutral matter. And in this process, you would expect to find more ionized material on the outer edges than in the center. If there is movement occurring in these filaments, then it is highly likely that this ionized material is coming from somewhere else. The ionization may well be occurring far away from this cloud. So why do I mention Markland convection then, as this implies that it should all become neutralized? In Markland's paper, he discusses that it is also possible that this inward pressure can be balanced by the outward diffusion of neutral matter. And there are also more complex ways of looking at a Birkeland current, which may also stop this Markland convection process occurring as well. And that is something that I will be covering in a separate video to this. But in this paper, they discussed one solution to this problem was that somehow the electrons in the cloud were not destroying the H3 plus ions. Oddly enough, they never once considered the potential that both the ions and the electrons were organized into filament structures, as Bratt had pointed out. And this would tend to stop the electrons from recombining with the H3 plus as easily. Markland convection would also account for the reason that we see an abundance of hydrogen and H plus ions in the outer section and will also provide a mechanism to account for the chemical reactions and the formation of the more complex molecules. We must also consider the evidence from sapphire. And this shows by just inputting hydrogen into the chamber, they were able to make many other molecules. And one of those molecules that they created was indeed the H3 plus ion. They also produced more complex molecules, including oxygen. So the question is, where are these elements created? Are they created far off in some more energetic part of the filament and then carried along the Birkeland current? Is it possible that some of these are created in situ at this particular point that we are observing with a much lower energy level than we previously thought was possible? So in a much simpler way, we have been able to demonstrate firstly why hydrogen might be found in the outer edge of a diffuse gas cloud. The H3 plus ion may have been created elsewhere and are transported across the filament. It may also be possible that if there are other electrical processes going on, that these may produce additional H3 plus ions in situ. The reason the plasma still remains as a plasma is twofold. Firstly, the movement of the plasma will tend to create a filament structure, which will draw material together. The electrons will move in the opposite direction, and if there is a vast difference in the speed between the electrons and the ions, 
then this will tend to allow the ions to remain ionized at a much lower temperature. These detections, therefore, are yet more evidence that our galaxy is filled with not only plasma, but that this plasma flows along branching Birkeland structures. Some of this plasma is invisible to us, and some becomes visible because of the reactions that take place within them. Now one other question that this raises for me is how the H3 plus ion can so easily give up its proton. The H3 plus ion readily donates a proton to initiate the cascade reaction, causing ionization into more complex molecules. In the conventional nucleus model, this is bound inside the nucleus by the strong nuclear force, yet somehow it is able to simply donate a proton almost as if it's an electron. Again, here we see evidence from Sapphire. They were able to transmutate hydrogen into many other elements with much, much lower energy than the standard model states is possible. In the conventional model of H3+, it is a triangular shape. But if we examine the structured atomic model, it is shown as a straight line. In the structured atomic model, there is no strong nuclear force. The proton is held inside the nucleus by electrons and the electromagnetic force. Does this provide a simpler route to explaining the ease with which it can give up a proton? This is certainly something I will be coming back to in the near future. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.